Well, thanks very much. We're here with Mike Clayton. Mike, thanks for joining us. Uh, professional golfer. You won eight times as a, as a professional, but you also had a, a wonderful stellar uh, amateur career, which we'll touch on soon. You're a keen commentator on the game through the media, but nowadays uh, through social media. You've forged a wonderful career in, in course design. But of course, you've been a regular visitor to New Zealand over the years, and in particular, Paraparamu Beach. So from our point of view, it's, it's wonderful to be able to connect with you again, and, and we look forward to uh, perhaps sharing some of those stories and, and memories that you had during, during those visits to our shores. Yeah, thanks. That would be nice to talk about one of my favourite courses, really. It's such a great place to play with. It's a long history. You know, Thompson and Nagel and all those guys who, you know, we used to read about them winning the New Zealand Open there when I was a kid. So it was, it was, great. It was great to go and play there for the first time. And then every time I went back, it was as much fun as it was that first time. Yeah, look, Mike, I know, or anyone that knows you knows that you're uh, infectiously passionate about the game of golf. Um, like I say, you're a commentator on it through regularly through social media. But taking it right back to the beginning, where was that passion and that spark really lit in terms of, of golf? I don't know. I started as a caddy, really, because I wanted some money. You know, my mate and I, so we went, jumped a fence and went to Eastern on it. Tuesday, and the assistant pro who was barely older than me, so he was about 16, I was 12, said, wrong day, mate, ladies' day, come back tomorrow. So I came back on, we came back on Wednesday, and um, a guy from Sydney hired me. I got a dollar for the day. I was a, oh, I loved it. From then, and there were some clubs lying around the house, so the assistant pro sort of said, you know, if you want to play, just jump the fence and stay out of the road of the members. And so I just... You know, I just started hanging around the pro shop and catting and got a regular two jobs on Saturdays for two old guys. And I know I just always loved being out there and I enjoyed the game and enjoyed playing it. The course was literally over the back fence, so I could play every day. So, you know, and I was interested in the history of it too. I read a lot about it. And so it was just something that captured me early on, really. I don't know why, but it was something I really enjoyed. And there were, you know, there were, and there were good people there. You know, the old guys were great. The kids were great that I played with. And, you know, you started playing schoolboy tournaments and met all the, you know, your contemporaries who were all trying to do the same thing. So the game kind of grows on you like that, really. At what stage did you take the game? Uh, did you get formal with the game, like as in taking a membership up and perhaps playing in a, in a club sense? Well, you couldn't join until you were 14. So um, remember, the, you know, the assistant pro, his dad was the greenkeeper. Mel Humphreys was the assistant, Merv was his dad. And Merv caught me out there one day sneaking on the course and he, um, he said, just stay out of the road of the members, you'll be fine, you can join when you're 14. So, you know, that, that's how you grow the game. You know, I was a 12-year-old kid who wasn't old enough to join, but it was the greenkeeper saying, just stay out of the road of the members, you'll be fine, I'll let you play. I'm not going to tell anybody. So I joined when I was 14, it was like maybe $12 a year or something. Yeah. So it was, um, you know, it was a great place for kids. It was fantastic, really. It's kind of interesting you talk about jumping the fence because I've, I've spoken to a couple of uh, golfers in this series and, and a number of them actually started by jumping over the fence and just getting a hang of it. And it's, it's interesting because from time to time in my role, I'll get various members come in and get a little bit upset when they'll see a kid on the course and, and things like that. But uh, it's, it's amazing how simply jumping the fence has lit the passion and, uh, and some of those young kids who have gone on to, you know, obviously great careers in golf and, and a lifelong love with the game. Yeah, the thing I love more, I mean, you don't see it anymore, but I love to see kids jump fences and sneak on. That was part of that was how you, that was getting into golf. That's how you got into it. Yeah. I mean, it was either that or go to a public course. So if you live near a golf course and you could jump the fence, I mean, no one plays at 4.30 anymore or 5 o'clock. If you can jump the fence at 5 o'clock in the winter and play for half an hour, then... Well, I mean, that, that should be encouraging those kids. So, Mike, at, at, at what stage? So, you, you got into a club at, at 14. Was that, uh, was that Eastern Golf Club or did you? Yeah, yeah, it was Eastern, yeah. Now, at what stage? You Obviously, you were pr progressing into the game. At what stage did you start to think, okay, hey, I'm, I'm getting pretty good here? Uh, you know, what was your handicap and, and what, what were you starting getting down to? Um, my first handicap was 12, which was... Um, 
I thought that was a bit low for me. I thought I should have been on 15 or 16. But either way, because when you were a 12-year-old, you think, I thought the guys who I carried for on 20 handicaps were pretty good. Yeah. So 12 was like, that was really good. But I'm not that good. But, um, you know, if you play every day, as I did, you quickly get a lot better. So by the time I was 16, I was in the state junior team. So it took two years to get from joining a club to make the state team. So I guess that was pretty quick. But, um, you know, Greg took up the game at, how was he, 15? He won a tournament at 21 on the tour. So, yeah. you know, if, if, you're, if you're any good and you, you, and you work hard, you can get pretty good pretty quickly at golf. So you were obviously getting getting good rather quickly, and you started entering into, into bigger events. Um, some of those, your, your state amateur tournaments, and uh, being a Victorian, it must have been a pretty special moment to to win your state uh, amateur tournament, the Vic Amateur, which I think you won twice. I did I won in nine seventy seven the first time, which was um, when I was twenty. That was well, I thought it was a big deal, but you look back, that was almost a year after Seve had finished second in the British Open. And he was a month older than I was, so it wasn't that big a deal. But yeah, it was, um, mind you, Seve was pretty good. But um, yeah, it was a measure of progress. I was, of course, when I started caddying, Mike Carla won it. He was winning it in the middle of winning it three years in a row, 71, two and three. So again, when you're that age, anyone who's winning the state amateur is a bit of a god around town. So um, yeah, winning the Vic Amateur was a big deal at the time. Was that kind of the era where, um, you know, it was kind of on the cusp between am- amateur golf was still a very respect, well, and it is still as respected now, but it was, it was seen as a respected profession, so to speak. Uh, you know, turning professional was perhaps going to the dark side. Was that, or was that, that, that a little bit earlier? I, was, if you, I mean, it wasn't a career in the strictest sense of the words, but there were lots of career amateurs, like Tony Gresham and Phil Wood, Colin Kay who were tremendous players who their career in golf, in competitive golf, was as amateurs. And it switched about then. I mean, the next year, I won the Australian Amateur in yeah. 1978. So before me, I think Jim Ferrier, Ted Ball, Bob Shearer, Bruce Devlin, um, Terry Gale, Bill Britton had turned pro. So maybe less than 10 guys in, in 80 years or whatever it was had turned pro. I won in 78, and since then, I think maybe one guy who won the amateur didn't turn pro. So in the next 40 years, everyone turned pro. So that was really when it changed. It was the late 80s, early, so the late 70s when, you know, we thought we were playing for decent amounts of money, whereas the generation before, Bob Shearer, you know, when he won in the year 1969, you look back at that, playing for $25,000 in the Australian Open. We, we, you know, my first Open 81, we played for 150. We thought we were playing for fortunes. Yeah. You know, so um, the game certainly changed around that time in terms of when you can make some half-decent money. You, you can at least expect to play full-time and pay your way. Whereas before that, you couldn't really, unless you were Peter Thompson or Nagel or someone who was properly good. So in that Australian amateur, was it Royal Queensland? Yeah. Yeah. No, who were some of the names that you had to perhaps go through on the way to that victory? Was there anything, any, any notable names that have gone on to? Well, I didn't have to go through anybody because um, I remember being on the practice tee. I only just qualified. I was on the practice tee with a mate of mine, Ian Hood from Sydney. And the draw came out. I looked at the draw and I said, Hoodie, every single good player is in the other half of the draw. It was, it was the most bizarre draw you'd ever seen. It was just, you know, we were to, just how the numbers fell, but Peter Senior, Gresham, Peter Sweeney, Chris Benithan, Colin Kay, Phil Wood, Gresham, were all on the other side of the draw. And they all knocked each other out. And on my side, I played Doug Perry, who was a good player from Victoria. Bob Stevens, who was an old guy, who I thought he was old, who'd been in the winning Eisenhower Cup team with Devlin in 1958. Elliot Booth, who was a good player, really good player in the semi. A guy called Glenn Cogger, who caddied for Norman when he won that Westlake's Classic. And they were good players, but all the stars were in the top half of the draw. 
So as they all knocked themselves out, I kind of fumbled my way through the bottom half and played Gresham in the final. He was the best player. He was defending champion and the best player in the country at the time. Yeah. And I kind of flicked him. I bit him one up. I had a flick. He shot out of the trees on the, from over the back of the 16th hole and stayed one up and um, beat him one up. But um, yeah, it was, a, it was a bizarre draw, really. So nowadays, you know, you'd win an amateur and, and you'd probably go pretty quickly into the professional ranks, but that was, that was still a couple of years away. You went back, you won another Vic amateur, and then you did turn professional. And uh, ironically, your, your first victory was again at Victoria in the, in the Vic Open. Yeah, which is not long after. I, when I turned pro in September of 81, and I played no good at all until the, I made the cut at Tweed Heads with Aussie Moore cutting for me, and um, which got you in the Australian Open. And I finished ninth in the Open there. I made $3,000, which was a fortune. Couldn't believe it. And then I came to New Zealand. I finished 10th at Tauranga, 12th at Titarangi, and then 28th in the New Zealand Open at Herotonga. So I made the top 60, which meant, meant I was exempt which was important. So then I uh, played well in South Australia, played terribly in the Tasmanian Open the next week. I made a hole in one on the last hole of the tournament. But I, had, I got a swing thought on that was bizarre on the 15th hole. I thought, I'll try this. I had two great shots up 15, three great shots down 16 par five, two great shots into 17, and ripped this four on it, ripped this four on at 18, Tasmania, went the hole. Won cool. five grand. I shot 76. That's how shit I was playing. What, 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 was, the, to, what was the winner's purse? He made 6,400, Colin Bishop. So <laughs> I go to the presentation. I'm sitting with Jack Newton, Stuart Ginn, and someone else who tied for second. And they got just over two grand each. And Jack looked at me and said, you lucky prick. He said, you make hit one decent shot and make five grand. I play my ass out all week and make two and a half. So anyway... I went to the Vic Open the next week and the swing thought was, I thought I'd found the secret to golf. And um, it lasted another week, pretty much. Right. I made another hole in one at 13, made 20 grand, playing with Trevino, and then won the tournament. So I made 43,000 a week, which was just crazy. I mean, I, you know, how was I six weeks removed from thinking $3,000 was a fortune to making 43 grand with two holes in one. So that was kind of a pretty crazy start, really. So just say you were playing with Lee Trevino. Yeah. Yeah, so those players were down, used to come down to Australasia during those years? Yeah, the Vic Open was a great tournament. I mean, Norman played, Marshy, Shearer. Um, Newton was obviously there. Trevino. So th that was the formula that Tony Charlton came up with when he would pay... He ran the tournament and he would pay one superstar every year to come out. So he started that off with Johnny Miller in 77, then Palmer in 78, player, who I played with I was in 79. I got drawn the first two rounds with him. Then I think Curtis Strange and Clampett maybe came the next year, then Stadler, and then Trevino came for a couple of years. So it was a great tournament in that time, amazing tournament really. I spoke to Paul Devonport uh, earlier this week and, and he spoke about playing with Ray Floyd in the 93 Australian Open at Metropolitan. Yeah, he was and there, yep. He said he had to stop himself from just watching Floyd play golf and, and check himself and say, hey, I'm actually I'm here to play golf as well. He said such was, this, uh, such was Ray Floyd's ball striking ability. He said it was absolutely just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, I remember Steve Williams was coming for him then. Yeah, it was um, Metro. So he, uh, yeah, Floyd was obviously a great player. I, I remember one thing he said about the course. He said, I love this course. He said, every fairway bunker you get into, all the perfect depth. He said, you can get on the green with a perfect shot. But if you miss it by two inches, you hit the lip. Right. And um, they've changed the fairway bunkers at Metro quite a bit since then. But he was right. I mean, every bunker was, was just at that height where if you had a nine-iron shot, you did a perfect nine-iron trajectory. If you got in the, in the long bunkers at 15 or the first, you could get out with a four iron, but you had to just nail it. it was the, they were perfect heights for two bunkers then. So at some stage, you start heading up to Europe, and I believe you picked up Steve Williams as your caddy at one point. And 
I read well, Steve. I that, Vic, yeah, I did. Well, I won that Vic Open, which meant that um, that was back in the days when you could just turn up on Mondays if you're an Australian, New Zealander. So Frank and I went over there, Frank Novello and I, and you, we just turned up on Monday and played the qualifiers. And if you made it, you played. If you made the cut, you, kept, you got into the next week. And so I played, I missed three. Frank missed two, I missed three. And we, we, we both made it in Germany. I played five weeks and then came home because it was kind of September. And then I went back full time the next year. And then Steve came for me then the year after that, 84. Now, I, I, now I read in Steve's book, and, and I think it's a direct quote from you. I think it was your contribution. Um, it was one of those rare moments where the caddy sacked the player, not the player sacked the caddy. Yeah, it was a year after he went to caddy for Eduardo Romero, which was probably a good move. Well, it wasn't probably a good move. It was definitely a good move on his behalf. So he was caddying for Greg in Australia, Terry Gale in Asia. He caddied for Michael King in Europe. Then he caddied for me. And then he went to Eduardo. Then Finchie, I think. And then Greg hired him full time. In 87, I think. 87, yeah. So he did Greg until Greg fired him. In, um, probably the only time Greg got fired, really. Um, Steve got fired. In, uh, after the Masters in 89. Yeah. It, they, they did a few more weeks and then he fired, Steve, Greg fired Steve, which was one of the dumber things Greg did. Maybe the dumbest ever, probably. Right. Right, so you're up in Europe, um, you're qualifying on Monday, but obviously you're, you're making those cuts, so, so you're probably uh, just focusing on the weekends. And then was it 84 you had your first win up in Europe? Uh, only one, yeah, one that. That was the first week Steve Kelly for me. Oh, so I remember we, there was a little range there in Beirut, and we were just walking to the first tee, and he said, I've watched you play a bit. He said, your concentration levels are hopeless. He said, all I want you to do this week is pay attention to every shot. I don't care how you play. You've got to pay attention to every single shot and concentrate properly, which was kind of a bit, well, what it was, you know, it was, Steve was pretty sure of himself. He was, he, I was, how was I? I was 26. He was probably 21 or two. He was pretty sure of his own ability then, which was, a, that was why he was such a good caddy. And he did a great job. We got, you know, we got off to a decent start and I shot, it was an easy course, but I shot 61 on Saturday, which made a big difference. Right, right. It's it's interesting you talk about Steve because uh, I've I've uh, enjoyed chatting to a couple of the older guys in the club that that uh, back when you know Parapadama used to you know kids used to caddy on the course etc. And uh, yeah, one of these older gentlemen said uh, Steve was only twelve at the time, but when he told you to pull a club, you took that club, and if you didn't take that club, you you incurred the wrath of this young twelve year old. Well, it was well, which just goes back to why Greg fired him. This what. They got to the last hole of Augusta in 89. And Steve tried to get him hit a three-wood off the team. He went with a one-iron. So we left himself a long way back. And he told me this story. And I know, because he's came for me, that Greg said, what do you think? And Steve said, it's a five-iron shot. When, when Steve says, it's a five-iron shot, it's a five-iron shot. And sorry, no, sorry, I, I've got that wrong. He said, it's a four-iron shot. Yeah. And Greg had hit the easy four-iron in 86 and hit it up into the crowd. So you know in the back of his mind, he doesn't want to do that again. He doesn't want to go with the easy shot again. He wants to go with a hard five. So he, and Stevie said, Greg, it's a four-iron. It's not a five. You won't get there. He said, Steve said he, ripped, he ripped this five, just hammered it. And it came up about three yards short of the green on the mound there, ran back down the hill. But you know when Steve said, I can, I can just see Steve there saying, Greg, it's a four-iron shot. Give me the five. You know, and he bogeyed that hole and missed the, missed the Hoke Faldo playoff by a shot. Yeah. He, but, he, you he know, just, if ever I'm in that situation, and when Steve said, it's a four-iron shot, it wasn't a five-iron ever, and it was never a three-iron. It was always a four-iron, and he was always right. When we went weeks when we would never hit the wrong club. That's why he was such a good caddy. You would never make a you would never make a mental error or a stupid mistake, and you would never hit the wrong club. It's interesting because I, I played a game of golf with him at Paraparama just before Christmas, and uh, we were just discussing there on the ninth hole, and he 
he lamented the, um, the the total reliance on TrackMan these days, and and the, the modern professionals who train with TrackMan. They don't do anything uh, without TrackMan. They carry around, you know, these massive books with grids and and, and things yeah. determining what kind of yardages. And and uh, Steve said it kind of did his did his head into a certain extent. Well, you know that when Steve was twelve years old, he didn't have a yardage book. <laughs> He was just looking at he was looking at the green like I did when I was twelve catting. He'd look at the shot and he'd say, It's a four iron shot. And he knew how to judge the look of a shot by an eye, by eye. So you know that when you stand on the sixteenth of power round with a fifth hole, you know what it looks like. The sixteenth hole would know when it looks like a nine iron shot. It doesn't look like a wedge, it doesn't look like an eight iron. So so you get a sense of what a nine iron shot looks like. So Steve knew how to caddy him and he could judge a shot by what it looked like. To his eye. I mean, now, you know, I go over to Sue O, who I play a lot with, you know, great player on the LPJ tour. She almost can't play without a rangefinder. So we go out there and just so put the rangefinder away and just look at it and pick a club and hit the shot. So it's the same thing that Steve's talking about is, you know, kids grow up now and they don't know how to judge the look of a shot without knowing first how far it is. So if it's 175 metres, it's a five iron shot. Doesn't matter if it's a, you know, it might be a little four or a cut three or a hard six. And one seventy five five iron. So that's how they pull a club based on a number. And Steve learned how to caddy and play by doing it completely the opposite. So there's a way for both. I mean, clearly it's, you know, it's always good to have a number in your head, and it's much easier to pull a club when you've got a number and you know exactly how far it is. But you don't want to lose the feel of and the instinct of looking at a target and feeling how far to hit the ball with your hands. And of course, a place like Power Pram or Bone Boogle or Portsy or Bowen Heads or the national, you know, the windy courses here, the, the number's only the start. You know, mm-hmm. the, the, you know, that's the first part of a three, part, three or four part process in pulling a club where you want to land the ball, the trajectory, the flight, the force. Now that, that that's what a rangefinder won't tell you. It just gives you a number. Um, uh, later on in the interview, I'm going to talk about a 126 meter hole in a certain club uh, that you drew that day. But we'll we'll do that yeah. later in the interview. But it, it probably clearly demonstrates the point you're making there right now. Um, Mike, so you're playing professional golf, and I'm thinking 1984. After what you've just said, was possibly your first visit to Paraparaui. I didn't play that year. That was the Akori one, right? Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, I didn't play because I don't know why I didn't play. Well, I'll tell you why I didn't play it. Because there will be one of two reasons. The first was that I wasn't exempt in Europe in 84. I was still pre-qualified because I just missed the top 60 the year before. And that week, Steve Caddy for me, I wouldn't have played except that because we were friends with David and Linda Frost and that, they took that week off to go to Spain for a holiday and, I, and would have joined them except that I was still pre-qualifying. I made the cut, so I had to, cut, so I had to go and play. But um, that year I played 23 out of 24 weeks in 17 countries. <laughs> and I remember three playing the last hole in at the Royal Dublin in the Irish Open and Steve said, I think you need to take a week off. So he was right. And then I had a week off and went back. I played pretty much all the way through to the Australian Open. And then I got an invitation to play the um, Casio tournament in Japan, which was the week after the Australian Open. So that was either the same week as the New Zealand Open or it was the week before it or something. But I was done. I mean, it was late in the year. I played 40 plus tournaments. So I think I was kind of, I can't face going to New Zealand. So what was, what was your so first? I, I was, so it was either because I was in Japan or it was I played 23 out of 24 weeks and 43 weeks of the year that I was kind of done. I was worn out. So what was your first trip to Paraparama then? Was it 1988? I guess it was, I guess it was 88, although I think I'd, I don't, I've, I've got a feeling I was somehow, I was, it wasn't the first time I played there, which doesn't make sense. But when I got there, I, 
I had a feeling I'd been there before. So did we play anything before that? Just 84 and 88? Correct, yes. We played roughly in 86, right, I think. And um, I guess it was my first time there, but it seems weird because I, I felt like I knew the course better. So then, it's, yeah, so, so 1988, you did line up in the field. Um, you shoot 65 on the last day in, uh, in, in conditions. Uh, so you shoot 65 on the last day. You're sitting in the clubhouse, your leader. Ian Stanley's still out in the course. Uh, you described that round of golf that you played that day uh, as one of the best rounds of golf you've ever played. Yeah, probably the best in terms of... Um, it was a horrendous day. I mean, it was blowing a hurricane. I think maybe one of the guy broke six, 70, maybe. I mean, 168, I think 68. So it was one of those crazy days when you're just trying to shoot power, really. It would have been a good score. I remember the second hole was a one iron, third hole was a one iron. I don't remember the fifth. Um, but and I remember 14, sorry, 17. So, sorry, 16. Yeah. So um, 16 was a four iron. So that was how windy it was. So it was a crazy day. And I just, and um, I don't know, I just, I had a good, again, it was like that thick open. I had a great swing thought. Um, Jeff Wagner, and we'd played together the last round the week before at Titarangi, and I hadn't played very well. And he gave me a little kind of swing tip. It was about, just about swing longer. I went down a program, I tried to swing a bit longer, and um, it, was, it was just a feel, really. And I played decently that week, the first three days. Nothing great, but decently. And I just played this crazy round on Sunday. So I don't remember ever... Stan was a long way ahead. What did he win by, two or three in the end, I think? I think, yeah, two or three. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I don't remember thinking I was ever had a really had a really good shot at winning it, maybe, but... He had, a um, little, he had a little moment behind the uh, 17th green. That was the first open I ever went to see. And I yeah. was standing behind the 17th green and uh, he'd gone over the back and you could kind of see that, that uh, you know, it's a, it's a difficult up and down and the pressure started to go on. And you saw his demeanour as a young fellow. I saw a, a guy's demeanour change quite instantly and he became quite testy with the, the cable boy that was trying to <laughs> gather in the cable in front of him. And uh, look, hey... He got up, he made a five, and I think he birdied the last hole in the end, and, 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 and it was comfortable. Yeah. But, uh, well, last hole, was, last hole was a Kimmy. Four, it was only a, I don't remember what I hit, but it was probably only a drive and a nine or eight iron. But I remember 17 was tricky that day because it was a bit across the wind, and I had a good shot in there with a nine iron that landed, I thought, perfectly sort of somewhere near the middle of the green and went over the back. So it was easy to go over the back that day. Where I got up and down, made four, but it was... A, and then the other, I played with Vaughan Summers. And I played really well, but it was a bouncy, windy, tricky day. And I hit one fairway. How's that for a stat? Mm -hmm. I hit one fairway for the day. And I drove the ball pretty well, but it was, you know what, those fairways, those crumpled fairways and how they were in, in big wings. And it was like I was driving the ball. I, mean, I was a straight hitter, really. I was one of the straight hitters around. But I remember hitting... One fair, actually on one cut fairway for the day. I mean, lots of them on the edges because you'll just trickle off the sides. And yeah. that was a born he counted up. He said, Shit, you only hit one fairway today. I was like, I went through. I said, You're right. I've got no idea which one it was, but it was, um, which is perhaps as a, um, I remember playing some Roy Pullman used to set up the New Zealand up, and I don't know if he'd set that one up, but I remember playing it. Shirley in 1982 and Pullman used to go to the US Open every year and come back and try and replicate the silliness of the US Open. So Miss Shirley was, you know, rock hard clay and bouncy and narrow fairways and rough and it was a bizarre setup really, but um, Power Bram certainly wasn't a course that needed narrow fairways. So the New Zealand Open was quite a regular fixture during that period, 88, 89. 91, 92, 93, you would have been a, a regular visitor during that period. I mean, what, what were New Zealand Opens like back then? And what was the, what was the feeling of, around? Where, where did you stay? Where did you, where did you eat? Um, you know, give us, give us some thoughts. 
you know, when you, when you're, that year at Power Plant 80R, I think we started on that motel on the 11th hole, is it? 11 or 10 or 11? 10, okay. The motel okay. there. Yep. Um, we just used to stay in, remember the motel we used to stay at, say at it, Titarangi? Uh, Heratonga, don't remember. No, it was a good, it was just a really good tournament. And Larry Nelson came and played a few years. Bill Rogers came down. So there are always a bunch of good players. Devlin used to play. Bobby Clampett played in, that New Zealand Open always had a great field at Tedarangi. Mm. So they're always good. I mean, Charlie obviously played, Shearer. Um, Greg never played much. I don't remember ever Greg ever playing down there, but Peter Thompson was always there. So they're always, you know, you'd look around, down, around the practice fair and there was always good, there were, there were always good players around. It was just a, it was a, you know, really important time on the Australian tour, really. It was, and the money was not a whole lot different than what we played for in the Australian Open. So it was good money. They were good courses. They were good crowds. They were, it, was, it was a really fun place to play. And we, before, back in the early 70s, they were playing six or eight tournaments on, on that tour. They used to play the, in, in Vicargill and Dunedin and all, all over the country. By 81, it was back to three tournaments, the PGA, the Open and the New Zealand tournament. Yep. So it, was always, it was always a great way to end the year. Did you play in the Tiger Woods Open in 2002? I did, yeah. I played that one. Yep. Okay. Now, yeah. now the course set up that day was uh, possibly, as you described, very narrow fairways, very long rough. Yeah, I remember I, um, I led the field in greens hit after 36 holes and missed the cut, which was kind of annoying. Um, <laughs> I, not that I played that well, but uh, well, I played okay, but I just didn't. Well, I, didn't, I had the ball okay. I didn't play very well. But uh, the course was, the greens were bad, weren't they? I remember the greens weren't great that year. They were kind of soft and parish and bumpy. and Possibly. Tiger, didn't Tiger 4 whack the second hole one day or something? Yeah, he did on the last day at a, at a four putt, which is, which is probably a good segue to, to shift slightly into, into design aspects. Obviously, like I said at the start, uh, you're quite involved in course design these days. You've, you've uh, done another, another number of projects yourself and, and some collaborations new courses, restorations. Um, Alec Russell is obviously the, the designer of our course. And I wanted to just start off by asking you, uh, you know, he only designed, or he's only credited with, with five designs. And yeah. it's probably fair to say that they're, they're fairly exceptional designs, the five of them. Um, what, you know, what, what is it about Alec Russell and his philosophy that has made his designs, I guess, so enduring? Uh, still to this day. Well, I don't know what his philosophy was. He didn't write anything. So you never know what his philosophy was. You assume because he was Mackenzie's partner in Australia that his philosophy pretty much aligned with Mackenzie. So I guess if you went and read Golf Architecture and Mackenzie's 13 Principles, they were probably aligned pretty much with what you know, or, or how Russell thought about the game. So all you can do is look at his courses and kind of glean what you can from his philosophies by how, what his courses look like. So he built beautiful bunkers at Royal Melbourne and Yarra Yarra. Um, wide his fairways, greens that were best approached from one side versus the other and the middle was never the perfect place. Um, he built great par threes, obviously. Great set at Parapram. Good luck at Karen up. East course at Royal Melbourne are exceptional. So, uh, Riversdale's terrific. So um, you assume, his, as I said, you assume his philosophy pretty much aligned with Mackenzie's. And so reading Mackenzie's book, you, you, my, my assumption is that that, was, that they were the things he believed in, which Mackenzie kind of wrote disparagingly about New Zealand golf. In the spirit of St Andrews, he said, New Zealand golf is dead. In fact, it's never been alive because committees there insist on using long grass as a penal hazard. As a consequence, golfers won't put up with the annoyance of looking for lost balls. So, I mean, that's not exactly right. But yep. so, um, you know, Power Brown was probably the one course that, and Mackenzie, and Mackenzie obviously never saw it. But that was the one course that, you know, there was a reason why it was the best course in New Zealand by a long way. 
and why Titaranga was the second best course because those you know those two men had such an influence on me. Yeah, you, you're clearly. So, I mean, you're clearly a proponent of, of width, and that's been quite evident uh, during the discussion at the moment. And, and I guess a lot of courses, um, you know, through the early years of irrigation with single row irrigation, fairways tended to creep in and playing corridors kind of cramped up. Um, we have just been going through in, in the last couple of years and actually automating our, our irrigation system. And as yeah. we've been doing it, we've been irrigating out to to new mowing lines and we try to take the width of of the the playing corridors out with short grass so. which would only be good yeah so etc so you know the argument could be oh you're making the course uh you're making the course too easy or i should be penalized if i'm if i hit a bad right. shot i mean talk me through some yeah, of those well the the classical i always thought that in fact i think one fair, well, obviously all the all the fellows missed that last out proud ram. One of them was the fourth, where it was almost impossible to hit it. But you know, there's a green where you really should play to from the left. The problem I always met was because the greens were tended to, you know, the years I played, they were quite soft or softish. You clearly had to play the best line into that back right flag was from the left, and it was hard to drive it up on the left. But you know, the ball would always feed to the right. But the fairway was narrow. The ball would trickle off into the rough. Because the green was softer than ideal, you could always get it across that bunker and stop it. Whereas if the green was firm, you could cut that rough. You would almost make it a common fairway with the, with the fern hole, right? Mm -hmm. Is it the, yeah. So make, if, 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 if that was all fairway and the ball bounced away to the right, you had that terrible angle. The further right you went, if, if my memory of the shot was right, you get behind that dune and it'd be blind if you went far enough right. And you're playing to a green that was hard and you couldn't stop the ball. So these people who argue that you're making the course wider, you make it easier. Well, for a start, they're mostly 18 handicappers who can't break 85. So if you're making it easier for them, that's only a good thing. And look at how many great courses are wide, like Royal Melbourne, Augusta. There's so many great wide courses but they rely on the old great course. Green, they rely on great green. The old course. They rely on great greens complexes to make it more difficult for the player who's gone to the wrong part of that wide fairway. Yeah. So it's no good having wide fairways with greens, soft greens, where you, where you can play to from anywhere. But there isn't a course worth anything that's got greens like that. So one of the great things about Pro Am is, you know, if you had all that rough that used to be right of the eighth hole. That was all fairway down there. And the green was hard. You could go down there. But, and if you hit a great shot, you could stop it across that bunker on that narrow green. Uh, but, that, but to me, that would make that a more interesting hole because you, you, you would have the option of going down the right. But the shot into that green was that much more difficult from the shot that you played to from the top of the hill going along that green. But because it's all rough or because it used to be rough, no one ever went down there. No one ever thought to go down there. But that would make a cool option down there, you know, playing it down that way. And, but if the pin was just over the bunker on the right, there was no one to get within 30 feet. Of if you wanted to go down there, you could at least try. So that's why the 17th hole is, you know, if you did a list of the best 18 holes in, in Australia and New Zealand, 17 at Power Pram would easily be on that list and it might be, might be one of the best three or four holes. You know, it's an amazing hole because it's got that option of going down the right and playing to the green from a completely different angle than if you go down the left. So, so there are so many cool options that, that you can create with width. If you, if you mowed that right fairway down as, you know, if you grew all that as rough, you would make the hole harder, but you would make it way less interesting and way less fun and way less good so why would you do that and power pram is a bouncy windy bouncy course with crumpled fairway so it, it needs width so you know again going back to that round i shot it's crazy that on a day that difficult on a course set up on the last round of the national open you could hit one fairway and shoot 65 so clearly i was playing well now what does that tell you it tells you the fairways are too narrow that's what it tells me anyway yeah because i was playing well and it wasn't like I had the sense playing that round 
that I was driving the ball badly. It was just that I was on a, you know, it was almost impossible to hit the fairways. Now, you've got a quote here I've, I've heard you say, and I, I just want to throw it into the mix and get your thoughts on it. Golf is, in, is an inclemently unfair game. Inherently unfair game. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah, the basis of golf, well, golf started in Scotland where, by definition, you were playing a lot of shots that people would argue today are unfair, like the Alps of Prestwick or the Himalayas where you're driving completely blind over sand hills or um, all the bad bounces you can get off, all the, you know, you can jam it up the face of the road hole bunker and you have to go out sideways, all the beardies or... There are so many things inherent in golf in Scotland that people would describe now as being unfair, which were all part of the game. And dealing with that unfairness was all part of it. Because with that unfairness, or in, in inverted commas, all that quirkiness, or, or, or the way the game was, came all the lucky bounces you got as well. I mean, you could skirt the right hole bunker by, by three yards and get a nice little kick and kick up around the corner up, up you know, within three feet of the hole. So is that good luck or, or good management or what is it? Well, it's just what the game is. The game gives and it takes away. So if you try, and, I mean, my argument is, if you try and make a course fair or you try and make it difficult by growing the rough in, you take away things that are great about golf. And there's, there's so much of the old course, which is the basis of all golf, there are so many things on that golf course that people would describe as, if you build it now, people would call it ridiculous and unfair. All the, all the blind bunkers in the middle of the fairways. In fact, if you, you drive it down the four in fairways, oftentimes from there, you, you, play, you play it down the fifth. In fact, it was funny, I was playing the 1990 Open, I think, and I drove it down the, I was, on four, I was, I was playing 14, and Steve was coming up the fifth. I assume he was coming for Floyd. And we kind of walked past each other. I was kind of looking at the shot and he just looked at me and said, just hit it down the fifth and kept walking. So, right. which was probably a two shot penalty for both of us. But um, either way, um, you know, if you build a hole now where the proper play was down the other fairway, people would just you know, think that was completely ridiculous. But the old course is the basis of all golf. So people who tried to sanitise golf and make it fair, you know, sometime after the Second World War, when America had more of an outside or, or, or an oversized influence on golf, and then PGA Tour players, who all think the game should be fair, so that you've got consistent rough and every bunker's the same and all the other stuff that those guys bitch about. You, know, you, you take away the fundamental essence of the game because you know, you know, people have often said that golf reflects life, but... Now, life isn't fair either. It's not supposed to be, you know. I mean, you try and make it as equitable as you can, but you know, some people get a bad deal. And, and, and golf, which is clearly, you know, golf compared with life is a pretty frivolous pursuit. It's fun. It's a game. You know, just deal with it. But don't ruin golf courses in an attempt to make them fair because you will only ruin them. What do you what do you think about the whole distance debate? Um, and it's come up on a couple of a couple of the interviews we've done so far about you know Paraparama being obsolete because it's it's too short. Um, I mean I've seen Ernie L shoot sixty around Royal Melbourne and that's you know four hundred yeah. meters long of it. Um, I'm just trying to find a quote. I'm digging up quotes of. Um, I can't, I've, I can't, no, I'm, I'm not going to find it. But um, it was a Tom Weisskopf quote from 1990 saying how, you know, it was just ridiculous how far the ball goes. And, um, you yeah, know, that was 1990. I mean, now it's completely crazy how far the ball goes. The USJ completely lost control of the ball. They lost control of the drive ahead. Um which meant you could make light, big-headed drivers, which meant you could make, and you could put 45-inch graphite shafts, you know, clubs with virtually no sweet spot, you hit them all over the face. So in the hands of modern young players, they're hitting the ball 
crazy how far the ball goes. I mean, there are five, there are five women on the LPGA Tour who average longer than Greg Norman did at his best. So don't tell me they're better athletes than Greg Norman. So, of course, every great course in Australia and New Zealand is obsolete. They're op- but they're obsolete, not for the members. They're obsolete for um, the best players in the world. If the measure of their... Of, if the measure is how, did, how Alec Russell and, and Alistair McKenzie saw those courses playing. So he saw that, you know, the sixth at Royal Melbourne, great, the great par four. I'm sure McKenzie saw that hole as being a rip across the bunkers and a five-iron shot. He didn't see it as being a two-iron across the bunkers and a wedge shot. Yeah. So if, if you think that hole playing is two-iron wedge, which is what it was in the President's Cup, if, if, you, if you see McKenzie design that hole around being a drive and a five-iron, if you think that being turned into a two-iron wedge hole makes it obsolete, then, yeah, it's obsolete in terms of how McKenzie saw it playing. So they're all obsolete, but they're not obsolete in terms of... They're still great pieces of design. They're just obsolete for how great players play those courses if the measure is how the designers saw them playing. So McKenzie, of course, was designing the hickory shafts. So those courses got stretched back. I mean, um, Royal Melbourne was probably 6,500 yards when he built it. So, you know, it's been stretched back over time. And to deal with better golf balls than steel shafts and better clubs that happened, you know, post-1930. But now we're in danger of obsoleting a whole nother lot of golf courses with the modern stuff. In fact, we've done it already. So, you know, courses in New Zealand and Australia don't have the room that Augusta has, all the money that you know, those clubs in America have, where they just keep stretching further and further back. Or they're great clubs that don't care because they don't hold pro golf, like Crystal Downs or National Golf Links or places like that that don't care about pro golf, who don't have mm-hmm. to, you know, prime value, don't have to measure themselves out for pro golf. But the thing, the difference in Australia and New Zealand golf is that all our championship golf courses hold, all our best golf courses hold championship golf. New Zealand, you know, state amateurs, national amateurs, pro tournaments. So not that we've got that many left, but you know, our, our best courses all want to have tournaments. But we watch our Royal Melbourne or Kingston Heath or Metro Victoria play now. Yeah, then, then they're obsolete. But they're not obsolete in, in the sense that they're still great bits of golf architecture. They're obsolete in the face of equipment that Mackenzie and Russell never envisaged being invented, let alone legalised. I mean, if Mackenzie came back now, he'd just go to the RNA and and just tear their heads off. (laughs) Like, didn't you guys read my book? What are you doing? Fix it up. You know, that's what you're... Now, their job job was and is was to protect the the, the integrity of golf courses and to protect the skill it took to play the game. And they've completely failed in both. I mean, they've come out now with a paper basically agreeing with everyone that John Huggin and me and everyone else has been, you know, Nicholas and Weisskopf and Nick Price and Jeff Shackelford and Tom Doak and Gil Hansen, everyone else has been banging on for 20 years. And they've been pushing back and arguing that we're wrong, you know, just old fuddy days who are living in the past. Of course, they've come out now with a paper that says, yeah, you guys are actually right. Well, hello, you know, Weisskopf was banging on about it 30 years ago because he could see what was coming. Yep. And, but, but I don't think anyone ever imagined the state it would get to now when there were, what, you know, 80 players averaging over 300 yards on the PGA Tour. Mm. I mean, Greg was, I mean, we all, you know, we all saw Greg play. I mean, Greg was phenomenal. He averaged 280 yards or 85 yards in the mid-80s. I mean, you know, that's Zach Blair territory now, <laughs> you know. And now, Mike, we've we've discussed obviously we just discussed equipment. We've discussed some course setup. Um, I'm a little bit nervous about asking this next question because I know, as a golf club, we're fiercely protective of what we've got, and 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 I believe it's it's really strong bones. As a course designer, however, looking at Paraparamu Beach, uh, is there anything that you would change, or is there anything that stands out for you that you would not necessarily change, but but add, improve? Wow, wow. Well, um... Well, the mowing lines are the obvious thing. I mean, I haven't seen it, of course, for a long time now, but 
I would always, my memory of it was that I would have the fairways much wider than they are where you can. Um, but I know you're working on that. Uh, I never loved 14 much. I mean, obviously that wasn't a Russell original hole. You know, it's nowhere near as good as the, three, the other three par threes, which are great holes. I mean, two, two, five and 16. If you took the, the four par threes as a set at Power Per Am and put them in Australia, there'd be a good argument to say that were the best set of par threes in, in Australia. That'd be certainly in the best three or four with Royal Melbourne, Kingston Heath, Victoria, Palm Bougal probably. Um, what else? I, now, I've seen Russell's original drawing for the 12th hole. Went, it kind of went to the right and went through the sand dunes down the right. I, yeah. you know, I, I looked at that with Greg and probably you at one point. I think that'd be a great hole to try and get built there. Yeah, the channel uh, hole, I think it's described yeah. as in architectural terms. So, you know, but they're, they're, this is nitpicking. These are little details. I mean, mowing lines are easy. Um, 14's n- not, not a patch on the other par threes, but it's a pity I never saw Russell's 14th hole, but it was a pity they had to change it. I, my, my guess is it was a pity they had to change it. Yeah. And, you know, maybe see what you could do with 12, because it's probably the least interesting hole. But you know, it's such a great course. That, you know, so much of... You know, that place is preserving what you've got. Because, you know, the, the good thing about that course as opposed to a lot of the best sandbox courses is you, you never had to deal with, you know, years of, as Mackenzie would have described it, misguided tree planting. You know, the tree planting on the sandbelt was atrocious after the war. And we've spent, you know, a couple of decades at Victoria, Kingston Heath, um, Peninsula, which, which was actually the best of them pulling down trees that should never have been planted. So both the wrong species and in the wrong places. So, and, and too many of them. So, so that was never an issue at Power Ram really was, I mean, yeah, I guess you had to deal with those pine trees they planted, but you know, there, there were never trees that interfered with the golf at Power Ram. So that was a, a huge advantage you had over the sand belt where, as I said, we were dealing with, you know, the post-war disaster of committee inspired Tree planting. Now, you, you, I mean, you've, you've discussed a number of, of holes. So, I, look, we're getting towards the back end of the interview, and I, I normally ask what your favourite hole is and, and, and why that might be. You may have already covered that off, or you may not have. But uh, feel free to share with us your, your favourite hole. Well, yeah. You know, if, if you look at, I mean, I play at Metro in Melbourne. Which, you know, most people, if they were to judge Metro and Power Pram, most people in Australia would, well, I don't know, they'll probably think Metro was a better course. But, and I love Metro. I've been a member there for 45 years. I love it. It's a great place, a great club, lots of great friends there. But it's built on an incredibly uninteresting piece of land. And, if you, and its strength is a sum of its parts. But there's not one world-class hole at Metro, not one hole that you would put in terms of this is a world-class hole. So the strength of that course, and even Kingston Heath, which has probably got one or two world-class holes, is the sum of the parts, the great routing, great bunkering, great greens, great strategies, you know, beautiful walks, all that stuff. But if you look at Power Pram, it's probably got, I don't know, six or eight world-class holes. I mean, three, five, um, 13, 15, 16, 17, you can put those holes up against anything in the world. I mean, I know that I could bring Ben Crenshaw and Bill Corder, Power Paran and Metro, and they would both be gushing in their praise of both courses. But if you, said, if you honestly sat them down, and they would never give you an honest answer because they're too honest but, and too nice. But if you said, okay, list the world-class holes at Metro and Power Paran, there'd be six or eight at Power Paran and probably none at Metro which is not a knock on, you know, people will take that as, what's well, a knock on Metro? No, it's not. It's almost <clears throat> in praise of Metro because its, its strength is, as I said, the sum of its parts. The way that those holes fit together make for a fantastic golf course. But Power of Prime is ultimately a better golf course because it's on a better bit of land. And Russell did a great job in using that bit of land, <clears throat> which allowed him to build world-class holes. So 17 is probably the best of them, but 
Now you could put that 17th hole Pap Ram on any list of great holes in the world and there's not one person would disagree that it wasn't amongst the best holes in the world. So that, Russell had the good fortune of getting a much more interesting piece of property than almost any course on the sand belt had, except for Royal Melbourne yeah. and probably Peninsula. But, um, you know, Metro, Kingston, East Victoria, the back nine of Victoria is pretty good. The front nine is not that great. Huntingdale, Commonwealth, Yarra Yarra. The strength of those golf courses was that they made, made the most of what they had. But it wasn't, you know, one thing they didn't have was really interesting land. And Russell had that in abundance at Parparam. So, you know, if you looked at <clears throat> the least good hole, it's probably the 12th, it's probably on the least interesting piece of land. Yeah, it is. Correct? Yeah. Yeah, flat piece is. of land down the, down the side well, of the yeah, road. It's yeah. probably the dullest, flattest piece of land on the whole place. So yeah. consequently, it's, it's the dullest, least interesting hole in the golf course. Not that it's a bad hole. It and just happens to be. And <clears> it's, <throat> it's, it's interesting. Russell's design actually takes in some of the more interesting land just to the right of that fairway uh, yeah. as, it, as it threads between the dunes and heads over towards 17 and then darts back on an angle over to the current green. So you, you're so right. I, I, I can remember looking at that hole with Greg Turner thinking that wouldn't be that, it's not that hard to put that hole back. Well, not put it back, but to build that hole. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> you know, if you're looking at doing something there, that, that would be one thing that'd be worth looking at. But, you know, the, the members over time have been pretty good custodians of that place. So I, th I would have thought. Oh, it's superb. And I, it's, it's, I mean, I've worked at a number of courses, but I'll have to say about um, Paraparamu Beach's members, is they're pretty educated when it comes to golf. They know exactly what the course is and what it should be and how it should be set up. And, um, you know, as, as a result, it's been relatively um, straightforward to be, you know, to, to, to work in, in that environment. It's been, it's been good. Yeah, no, you know, I and mean, Russell did an amazing job. You know, so, and it's still, you know, I, I don't know where it is, whether it's in the top 100 in the world or not now, but it's... Um, yeah, so, I mean, of course, it depends what list. But uh, it yeah. has come back into the top 100 on several lists, yeah. Yeah. The best list is the golf magazine or golf.com, golf magazine, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's, it's probably on the edge of the top 100 there. But it look is, at yeah. how much better the top 100 list is now than it was 30 years ago. How many great new courses have been built since then. So for Par you know, for Paraparam to hang in there on the edge of the top 100, it's an amazing effort, really. But, well, well, you know, well, well, it's not an amazing effort. It's testament to how good a course it is. If you look at all the great courses that have been built, Abandon, Cape Kidnappers, Tauriti, the two courses at Bamboogle, uh, you know, Castle Stewart. There have been so many brilliant courses built in the last 30 years so that a course that was top 100 in 1980, that's the equivalent of top 150 at least now. You know, you know, well, well top, you know, it, it's as hard to make the top 150 now as it was to make the top 100 then. It's probably a better way to put it. So, um, you know, it's a tremendous golf course. Hey, how do you see, you know, post um, COVID nineteen? Uh, what kind of opportunities do you do you see to, do you see for golf? And and you know, obviously, society is going to be dialed back to a certain extent. Um, you know, with around sustained social distancing, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, how do you see golf being positioned post all this? Uh, Tricky. Um, yeah, who knows what people's in, what's going to happen to people's incomes, really? So, people are going to rejoin golf clubs or join golf clubs. I mean, I mean Power Prem at 1500 bucks a year is the best value of golf in the world. So, there's not a member there who's got an excuse not to pay their membership fees. But it'll be interesting to see. I mean, Melbourne's got a certainly a, the, the demand for golf um, is. I'm going to. Um, the, the, the supply the supply exceeds the demand in Melbourne. So the second tier sandbelt courses, which are tremendous, places like Spring Valley, brilliant courses. I mean, it'll be, it'll be interesting to see how they come back, what they do. The Spring Valley was struggling before this. So whether it, who knows what happens to it, you know, whether all the members rejoin, whether they can't sell it because it's, you know, there's a tip next to it. And so the land, they can't ever sell the land. So does it come back as a, as it was, does it come back as a public course? Does it come back as a semi-private public course? Who knows what happens? But um, you assume that the clubs lower down the pecking order all around the world are going to struggle because 
members are going to struggle to pay fees. What's um? So, but but no one knows how that's going to play out really. It, in Melbourne, if you lost a few clubs, honestly, it mightn't be the worst thing, because it would, in theory, farm the the, the members out into the surviving clubs and make them stronger. So, you know, it's, it's yet to play out. Who knows what happens to the Pro Tour? You know, I think the Pro Tour is going to look a whole lot different all around the world. What happens to the European Tour? What happens to the, you know, the US Tour? It's hard to imagine that the US Tour just starting up and playing for $10 million every week again, mm. as they do now. So, that's going to be... It's going to be I, mean, I think we're all guessing at this point. But the important thing for the game is to make sure that the best golf courses, the best golf courses survive and you don't lose great courses out of this. So, and, and members have got to support their clubs and pay, pay their fees and make sure they keep going. Because if they don't, they'll go away. Um, Mike, one of your latest projects has been Peninsula Kingswood, which was exactly that, a, a merging of two clubs, yeah. uh, sharing of resources and, and the selling of one, uh, one plot of land to, to put into the other plot of land. Um, I mean, I'll be fortunate to, to go there. Um, it's incredible what's been created there. I mean, it's, it's honestly on, a, on, a, on another level. Uh, we've been very fortunate as a club uh, with, I guess, you know, your influence and assistance there is to take them on board as a, as a reciprocal. Now, it's just a, it's a newish reciprocal. Obviously, borders are going to be shut down for a little while now, but uh, it's a place that I can obviously see our, our members um, thoroughly enjoying over the, over the next 10, 15, 20 years, however, however long they retain their memberships. But. Well, it's a great deal for both clubs because it's a, you know, Power Prem's a great place for Peninsula members to go and play there. But so, I mean, I mean that, that, that's what a great reciprocal is, is that it's a great deal for both clubs. So you're right. I mean, Peninsula's an amazing place. For, for, you, can, you can stay at the golf course, 36 holes, great practice fairway, so, and, and two tremendous golf courses. So, so it's a, it'll, it'll be a great deal for your members, but... It, you know, it works both ways. But, um, you know, it's a, it's a great thing about golf in Australia that, you know, there are the great interstate reciprocal arrangements for clubs all over the country. So, so it, works, it works really well. So, yeah, I mean, you know, it's a perfect deal for your members. Hey, Mike, it's, a, it's always good to talk. Um, it's been a wonderful insight both into your, your early years and your playing career, your memories here at Paraparami Beach, your extraordinary memory for the course. Uh, and your thoughts on course setup, design principles, a, a couple of those quotes. Um, I've really enjoyed having a chat to you. Thank you so much for sharing some of those thoughts. And, uh, and Mike, as always, I think you said it's been a while since you played us. Uh, I think it might have been 04, perhaps. So you're, yeah, you're, you're, well, you're well overdue for a, for a visit to us. And, uh, you know, certainly I'd, I'd love to have a walk around the place and perhaps we walk some of that land down the between the 12th and the 17th, but uh, it, it'll be great to welcome you back again. Yeah, I'm, well, I'm well overdue and I'm, I'll be back, well, probably not this year, but um, hopefully next year. So um, I, I, I certainly look forward to catching up with you and the members and the golf course. So let's make a date of that and ensure we do it. Mike, really appreciate your time. Thanks so much and take care during this period. Thanks, Leo. Thanks, mate.